Okay. So Ed Moritz and I both co-authored this paper um, about highest and best use because highest and best use is widely discussed as it pertains to real estate, but there's limited discussion as to how this concept pertains to mineral rights. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the concepts of highest and best use as they pertain to mineral valuation. Um, then I'm going to describe some trends that we've observed in the mineral industry given recent advances in technology. Um, we should carefully consider highest and best use of a property and be aware of the different uses one property may have. So it's fundamental in any type of real property appraisal, as is required by USPAP, to form an opinion of highest and best use of a subject property. <coughs> Standards Rule 1-3B requires that an appraiser develop an opinion of the highest and best use of the real estate. Um, and you also should analyze the relevant legal, physical, and economic factors to support your conclusions of highest and best use. The property, once you decide the highest and best use of it, is then appraised for that use and for that use only. In addition to USPAP, the Uniform Appraisal Standards for Federal Land Acquisitions, which is also known as the Yellow Book, um, requires that you also form an opinion of highest and best use of the subject property. Um, appraisers are guided by the definition which was derived from the court case of Olson versus the United States. Uh, it states that the highest and most profitable use for which the property is adaptable and needed or likely to be needed in the future is its highest and best use. There are four tests that are required in highest and best use analysis and they should be considered sequentially. These tests are considered sequentially in the sense that only those uses which are legally permissible are, or have a reasonable prospect of being legally permissible are tested for whether they're physically possible on the site and so on through this analysis. So the first test of highest and best use is uh, legally permissible. Uh, the constraint of legal permissibility in real estate and as well as the mineral estate arises from a power reserved by the governing entity over land uses. Uh, the mineral extraction should be compatible with any zoning laws, whether they be at a federal level, state level, or county level. Um, permits are required by regulatory agencies. Uh, they can also vary from federal county levels. Um, and the developer of the mineral estate must have the legal title to the minerals. I mean, for example, in this picture, a lot is able to be permitted these days. I mean, there's an active drill rig on the Oklahoma State Capitol lawn. And the next test, if, the, if it passes the legally permissible test, the next test a property must pass is uh, physically possible. This states that the minerals must exist. This is usually confirmed by some type of exploration work. The picture on the left shows some core samples which were collected as part of coal bed methane exploration, which this would verify that coal, bed meth or coal is present, the mineral is there under this property. Um, new technologies tend to change what minerals are reasonably accessible. Another part of the physically possible is that you must be able to access the minerals. Um, and we see with this offshore platform that as technology advances, this change has been changing over time. Now we can get to minerals that are in very remote and challenging locations, due mostly to advances in technology. So once the highest and best use passes these first two, it must also pass the test of financial feasibility. Uh, financially feasible uses are those that are likely to produce an income or return equal to or greater than the amount needed to satisfy financial obligations, such as land acquisition, operating, operating expenses, and so on. <clears throat> All uses expected to produce a positive return are regarded as financially feasible. Um, in order for mineral extraction to produce a positive return, it needs an active market. So this picture on the left, the big scar in the land is an image of Bingham Canyon Mine. And then, it's kind of hard to see in these images, but there's little patches of aggregate pits along major roadways that border the greater Salt Lake area. So it would appear that these quarries both have, they're favorably located in an active market. Another requirement for financial feasibility is that the minerals must be able to be produced economically. 
Uh, on the right is a photo of the Diavik Diamond Mine, which is in the Northwest Territories in Canada. It's a very remote location. It has its own airstrip. Uh, the financial feasibility of this project is possible because of high value minerals. Um, it may not be possible if there was a lower value commodity in this location. And the final test of highest and best use is maximally productive. Um, this involves determining if the use is maximally productive. It must pr generate the highest net return to the developer. So in order for mineral extraction to be the most profitable use, <clears throat> it must be more profitable than the relative other uses over a reasonable period of time. One aspect of highest and best use under the guidance of the Yellow Book is the unit rule. Uh, the unit rule requires the valuing of property as a whole rather than by the sum of its individual parts, um, meaning that the property as a whole can have only one highest and best use. And this, as technology is changing, is becoming a little more complicated because as you can see in this picture, there is an oil rig concurrently producing with agricultural use. And on the right, there appears to be a gas rig that, on property that is also subject to grazing. Um, we are now seeing a bunch of trends in technology that minimize the footprint, especially as it relates to oil and gas, which is making the whole unit rule a little more complicated as it pertains to mineral appraisers when you're determining the fair market value. So resource plays are one, probably, maybe one of the best examples of how the technology's advancements have made the analysis of highest and best use more complicated. Um, the discovery of resource plays, also known as shale gas plays, have led to major changes in drilling technology over really about the past 30 years. Um, that these technologies may potentially make the surface and subsurface uses compatible on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, since the shale gas plays are so widespread, the issues of compatibility may become more prevalent in mineral, mineral valuations as oil and gas development continues in the future. I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of the Barnett and the Marcellus Shale. I mean, these are huge plays that oil and gas developers are actively trying to become part of right now, just due to gas demand in this country. Sorry, oh, yes, yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> so the two major changes in drilling technology um, in involve horizontal wells and also not just having one horizontal well, but having multiple horizontal wells out of one surface well pad location. Um, the image on the left shows an example of a horizontal well with multiple fractures. Uh, what this technology has allowed the oil and gas industry to do is put one hole into the ground and then fracture the reservoir over a certain lateral length. Um, this means that they have more access to a reservoir with having to use less wells. Um, they also are using multiple wells from one well pad, which significantly, re significantly reduces the surface impact. Um, you, know, you need less pipeline, less facilities, just uses a lot less land in general if there's up to, in some cases, 16 wells coming out of one surface location. Um, and these improvements may make the legal issues slightly easier just because there's less permitting that will be required on the surface. Um, things might be more physically possible that were not possible before by employing this horizontal drilling technology. And if, the co if there's less wells, the cost of the overall project can go down, which may make the project more financially feasible. Um, both of these technologies are used. Uh, this really began in the Bar Barnett, and it's widely employed in the Marcellus right now. So maybe the best example of how there is a potential for compatible uses in the oil and gas industry is recent work that Chesapeake Energy has taken on. Um, Chesapeake has been very successful at drilling oil and gas wells under urban areas. Uh, one example is Chesapeake recently acquired rights to drill under the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Uh, the General Counsel for Chesapeake stated that the start of drilling at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport 
is a prime example of unconventional opportunities created as a result of recent advances in horizontal drilling and completion technology. We also have a much better scientific understanding of how shale gas can be best extracted, and improved economics with structurally higher natural gas prices make it cost effective to pursue large-scale drilling initiatives such as this one. Um, as stated by Chesapeake and the FAA, the drilling under the airport should have no effect on the activities of the airport. Um, there's horizontal drilling being employed in multiple locations, and they plan on drilling at least three wells from one well pad throughout the airport. Chesapeake has actually drilled four wells. Um, there's one that reaches almost 8,000 feet under the airport. So they can go pretty far without having any surface disturbance. Um, in the immediate area. Um, so in the picture on the bottom is another example of Chesapeake. They've actually drilled under parts of Fort Worth in a similar way to what they're doing at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Um, but in the case of the airport, the most, the profitable use for the surface is the airport and the profitable use for the subsurface is gas production. Um, Chesapeake must consider this gas production to be somewhat economic if they were willing to spend $186 million just to gain the rights to drill that oil and gas reservoir. Um, and other companies are following this trend all over the country. Um, there are property owners out there that are receiving royalty payments right now for operators drilling under subdivisions. And there are other cases, although not as large as Chesapeake, where operators have drilled under other airports throughout the country. So in this case, with Chesapeake and the airport, um, both uses, the airport and gas production, are legally permissible. They were both permitted and regulated by government entities. Um, both uses are physically possible. They're current uses right now. That shows that they're physically possible. Uh, the use of the property for an airport and for gas production are both economically viable uses. And it seems apparent that minerals have a major contributory value to the various uses at the airport. And drilling for gas shale can be highly profitable, as is running an airport. Which this is where some of the complications now come in in establishing highest and best use. And we tried to find... Oops, we tried to find examples of mining that are, would be comparable to what the oil and gas industry has seen. Um, we really did not find any non-surface or non-mineral related surface uses that are compatible with mining to this degree. So if anyone has any examples, we welcome a dialogue about compatible surface uses with mining. Um, the one trend we did see is that oil and gas and mining seem to be concurrent in some areas. Um, the image on the left, the pink is an outline of potash deposits in New Mexico. And this has been actively mined for 75 years now. <clears throat> and oil and gas production has also been present in this area within the active mine for almost 75 years. Um, they haven't had any safety issue issues yet with producing oil and gas out of a potash deposit that's being actively mined. Um, they are requiring that wells be drilled horizontally just to decrease the impact that the drilling will have on the mine recovery. Um, there are also many cases of degassing CBM in advance of coal mining, which should potentially make the threat of coal mine explosions less if you can degas the reservoirs prior to mining it. Uh, the photo on the right actually shows some coal bed methane wells at a San Juan coal mine in New Mexico that do serve the purpose of degassing in advance of coal mining. Um, these examples, like the urban drilling examples, illustrate how there's a possibility of compatible uses that should be considered in highest and best use analysis as part of a mineral valuation. So a mineral appraiser should consider the value of the property based on opinions of highest and best use. There are many recent examples of how the petroleum industry has developed technologies to extract minerals with minimal surface Im impact, even in urban areas. Um, the highest and best use for mineral development may not be an either-or situation anymore, so we as appraisers need to think carefully about the unit rule 
and should carefully consider the issue of contribution to value by multiple uses. All right, thank you. And questions? Have they ever considered anything oh. like a, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just a comment for you to ask about mining and the urban area. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of people in this room are aware of it. There's underground limestone mining in Lexington, Kentucky, under Lexington, Kentucky, and under Kansas City, Missouri, as well as salt mining under Cleveland, Ohio, Lake Erie, and Detroit. And have, do you know if they've seen any problems associated with that? Or? You need to repeat Oh, okay. what he said into the microphone. Okay, so there are cases of limestone mining in various areas in the country. They've been going on for a long, long time, and interestingly enough, the underground mining in Kansas City has been converted to offices and warehouses as well as dust. <laughs> All right, well, I'll look into that. You know, I knew of um, some coal mining properties, but I was looking a lot in the anthracite district where they had some pretty large subsidence problems due to coal mining. Is the, on, on that particular issue, on the right segregated, or is it uh, uh, like the example where mining and the both the surface and the mineral water? I don't know. I have not been in the book. The question there was, uh, have the rights been segregated? And the answer, I believe, was not sure. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, thank you. to argue <laughs> against that one. <laughs> uh, now, this, uh, I, so, uh, so the, uh, the statement, uh, the question there was, uh, does the highest and best use rule not accommodate multiple uses? Uh, uh, we're getting into an area of uh, which uh, Brianna and Ed can argue with me on, but uh, as the chairman, I'll throw my version in here of, uh, well, I'll actually throw out a question. Uh, yeah, when, when there are two highest and best uses for a property concurrently, is it two highest and best uses, or is it a combined highest and best use that we're evaluating? I, I, I think I would answer not necessarily that multiple uses are excluded in highest dimension, but the, the, the issue really boils down to... Uh, uh, how about coming up here and <laughs> using the microphone? <laughs> I think, at least from my standpoint and how we've looked at it, um, you know, I think the question is, is, does highest and best use necessarily exclude one use versus the other? And the answer is, is really no, it doesn't. What the, the issue that is uh, of concern is that in some cases, they try to uh, not have them to be additive. So for example, if you had the highest and best use of a property of the surface would be for agriculture, but then you also had valuable mineral deposits uh, like sand and gravel, the, the two would not necessarily be compatible and then you would have to look at one versus the other. And, both, and, and so this whole issue about whether or not the different uses can be additive has been a subject of debate. But then what we're finding now, especially with the shale gas, is that they can be compatible and they both can have contributory uses to the, to the property. I have a follow-up question to that. Do you know of any uh, pending regulation or movement to adjust that highest and best use rule? Is there anything in the on the table to accommodate? Because it seems like that is going to be the future is multiple use. How can we do this as technology improves? Uh, The, the short answer is no. Yeah, the, yeah the, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so the, the question is, is there any amendment to that rule that we're aware of? And, and I think it would be largely driven by the Yellow Book standards and the Federal Acquisition Regulations would be in part not. And I, the answer is no, I'm not aware of any, any move to adjust it.
Well, uh, thank you very much for an excellent paper to both of you for that.